Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, so this talk is going to be a deep dive into the GraphQL resolve info object, and specifically in the context of how we can use it to help build efficient uh, data fetching queries, specifically from a database. So my name's Will. Uh, I work for a company called Neo4j, which is a graph database. Anyone using Neo4j? Show of hands. A few folks. OK, cool. So I work on uh, a team at Neo4j called the Neo4j Labs team. So I don't work on the core database. Instead, I work on tooling and integrations around the database, um, one of which is our GraphQL integration, uh, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So here's a little bit about Neo4j. This talk is not about Neo4j. Um, it's just sort of helpful to understand some of these concepts uh, as we dig into some examples here. So Neo4j is a graph database. So what that means is the data model, uh, unlike tables or documents, the data model for the database is a graph. Specifically, uh, we call this the labeled property graph model. And we use a query language called Cypher to query the data uh, in Neo4j. You can think of Cypher as kind of like SQL, but for graphs. Here's, uh, here's an example, Let's see if I can zoom in on that. Yeah, sort of. Um, so up in the, the upper right there, there's an example of a Cypher query. And basically with Cypher, you're sort of drawing this ASCII art notation uh, for expressing a graph traversal, uh, which we'll, we'll see a little example of this later. Um, so primarily, just, just think of Neo4j as, as a database where the data model is a graph. Uh, and among some of the, the other interesting integrations and tooling we have for Neo4j is our GraphQL integration. And specifically, uh, Neo4j GraphQL JS, which is this JavaScript library, the goal of which is to make it easy to build GraphQL APIs on top of Neo4j. So I, I want to make an important distinction here. Um, when we're talking about using GraphQL with Neo4j, we're not talking about querying the database directly with GraphQL. I mean, GraphQL is, is not really a database query language. It's, it's a tool for building and querying APIs. So the goal of this library is to make it easy to build that layer between your client and the database. Um, and we do this by uh, taking GraphQL type definitions to drive the database model, uh, generating a GraphQL API, auto-generating mutations uh, and, and queries and resolvers for, uh, for data fetching so you don't have to write boilerplate data fetching code, and then also being sort of as extensive uh, as possible so you can have custom logic in that layer as well. So we, we bundle this up in what we call grand stack, which is GraphQL, React, Apollo, Neo4j database, which is this sort of full stack framework just showing how all the pieces fit together. Um, so if you hear anyone talking about grand stack, this is, this is what they're talking about. So to Neo4j GraphQL JS, there's basically two main jobs uh, that this library is doing. One is schema augmentation. So this is taking your type definitions or taking an already existing uh, executable GraphQL schema and adding the query and mutation types, adding uh, filtering, ordering, pagination, input types uh, for this, uh, also exposing the native database types, like the, the date time, the spatial things. Um, so that's one piece. And then the other piece is what we can call GraphQL transpilation. Uh, so this is basically when you issue a GraphQL request, our integration uh, translates that GraphQL query into a single Cypher query, so to a single database query, so that you can resolve that entire GraphQL request in one round trip to the database. Uh, that query then gets optimized by the database's execution engine. Um, and this is good that this, this addresses what's known as the n plus 1 query problem, if you've ever uh, sort of had that problem with GraphQL, where you're sending multiple round trips to the database. So this is the focus um, of this talk, is on uh, sort of how we use the GraphQL resolve info object to make this GraphQL uh, transpilation happen. So I, I'm not here to convince you that a graph database is the best backend for a GraphQL API. That, that's kind of beside the point. Um, even though there are, are some pretty neat um, symbiotic benefits of, of having a graph model in your API and in the database. Um, but again, that, that's not what this talk is about. Instead, what I want to do is convince you that this GraphQL resolve info object is not scary. This is something that is uh, accessible. There's tooling around this, and we can use it 
to make more efficient resolvers and more efficient GraphQL APIs. So that's my goal today. So first, let's take a look at kind of a, a motivating example here. Um, so I thought it would be fun to have a GraphQL API for the GraphQL Summit schedule. Uh, so I scraped the Summit schedule page and loaded that data into Near4j. So we're modeling, you can see this in, in the middle here, we're modeling uh, sessions as nodes, speakers are presenting sessions, sessions are in a room, uh, we have the theme, the track of the session, uh, who the presenter works for. So this is all modeled in, in Near4j as a graph, uh, and then we expose a GraphQL API uh, on top of that. And the code for this is it, you can find it at bit.ly slash summit graph. Um, it's also running online, so you can, you can query this now if you want to find what the next talk you should go to uh, is summitgraph.grandstack.io. Um, and let me, let me just sort of zoom in on this query. So here, well, let's just do this live. Why not? So summit graph grandstack.io. So here, this is GraphQL Playground. How many people have used GraphQL Playground? This should be pretty, pretty familiar to folks. So if we look here um, in the docs, we can, explore, uh, we can explore the schema. And we can see here we have entry points in our query type that matches the uh, types or the, the node labels, as we call them in the property graph, in our database data model. So uh, I have uh, speakers, companies, rooms as, as my entry points. Uh, and then I have all these mutations for, for adding data as well. And I have a bunch of filtering and, and ordering and pagination things here. So this query here, I'm uh, starting with sessions, filtering for uh, sessions where the abstract contains the word resolver, uh, grabbing some fields, traversing the graph a little bit, who, who is the presenter, who do they work for, uh, and then we have this recommended field here. Uh, and we get an error, that's not good. Let's try it locally. Okay. Cool, so locally it works. I don't know what's up with that hosted one. But same query, uh, and we can see we get back uh, some sessions and some the fields we requested on those. We get back some recommended sessions. So this is the session we're in now, uh, GraphQL Resolve Info Deep Dive. Uh, if you like this one, here's some other sessions you might be interested in. So that's the, the GraphQL API that we built that uses the integration that we're talking about today. Um, we, can, we can also query this in the database. So here's uh, a screenshot of Neo4j browser. This is like the, the query workbench for Neo4j. So we write cipher queries at the top and then we get uh, results um, visualized either as a graph here or, or as a table. So this is sort of the equivalent cipher query for that GraphQL query that we just wrote. So find sessions where the abstract contains resolver, then traverse the graph a bit to find, uh, okay, who, is, who are the speakers, uh, who do they work for, what's the theme, what's the track, uh, and so on. So you can see there's, there, there's a, a fairly tight uh, match there between our GraphQL query and uh, querying the database, although it, it looks a bit different because it's, it's a database query language. So, okay, so how did we build that GraphQL API? Uh, well, here's, here's the code. Um, and basically all this is on the left, sorry, this is, this is kind of small, but I, I just want to get all of it on the screen there. On the left is our GraphQL type definitions. So we're defining a speaker type, a session type, the session has title and abstract, we're defining how these things are connected uh, and, and so on. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, that type definition uh, file in a second here, but on the right, this is all of the GraphQL server code for this example. So we're pulling in uh, Apollo server. Uh, how many people are using Apollo server? Just curious. Okay, good amount. Uh, we're pulling in the, the JavaScript Neo4j driver, and from this Neo4j GraphQL JS uh, library, we're pulling in this make augmented schema function, and we're passing that just our type definitions. And then we, we just create a driver instance, and we spin up Apollo server to serve our, our GraphQL API. And there's, there's something missing here if, if you've um, used Apollo server to build GraphQL APIs before, 
And that's our resolvers. So we didn't write any resolvers here. All we did was write our type definitions, and this New York GraphQL JS uh, library is giving us uh, an executable schema that's generating and attaching resolvers uh, that's backing those queries and mutations that we saw in Playground. So there's some, some magic going on there. Um, but but the, the code is here if you, if you want to check that out. Um, but where is this magic coming from? So the magic is largely powered by the GraphQL resolve info object. So I want to talk about how we can use that to build more efficient GraphQL APIs. So first of all, um, let, let's take a step back and, and talk about resolvers. So what is a resolver? Uh, well, neither of these things are resolvers. That, that's not very helpful. Uh, these are our type definitions again, and then our GraphQL query, just to, to remind ourselves that we're querying for sessions, traversing that, that data graph a little bit to find speakers, what room it's in, recommended sessions, uh, and so on. And so resolvers, those are the functions that define how to fetch that data from the data layer, right? If it's uh, calling out to another API, if it's calling a database, if it's reading from a flat file, wh whatever it is, the resolver is the function that has the logic for fetching that data. Uh, and in the resolver, uh, we're passed four arguments. So uh, the parent uh, in the, the root entry point, this is, uh, this is always null. Um, but then, because resolvers are called in a nested fashion, basically whatever we, we've resolved for the parent uh, is passed in there. Any field arguments uh, are passed in, so any arguments for the field that we're currently resolving uh, are passed in that argument. Uh, every resolver is also passed a context object. This is where we do things like stash database connections or API instances for our, our, our ORM, maybe things like that. And then. The fourth argument is our friend, the GraphQL resolve info uh, object. So here's using kind of a, a fake database thing, what our resolvers might look like for this GraphQL summit schedule graph that I showed. Uh, so we have a session query resolver, that's, that's our root, it's doing uh, some lookup to find sessions by some search term that's grabbing from uh, the params objects, so that's our search string, we typed in resolver, whatever we're searching for. And then in a nested fashion, the other resolvers are called. So uh, for session, we, we want to know the room, so our fake DB has some way to figure out the room, given a session ID that we grab out of, uh, out of the parent object, and we do that for the theme and, and recommend it also. So this is, this is a great example of that n plus one query problem where we're, we're not going back to the database multiple times uh, to fetch different pieces of data. That's, uh, that's not good. Th there's workarounds for this, right? So the data loader pattern that can give us some batching. Uh, but what if we could just generate one database query at the root level to resolve everything we need? Also just pointing out here that this info, this, uh, GraphQL resolve info object is passed to each one of these resolvers. OK, so what is, what is this GraphQL resolve info thing that we've been talking around? Uh, well, there are uh, nine, 10 maybe, 10 fields on it. Um, this slide is, I'm sure, very hard to read, but I want to go through this just really quickly. So we have the name of the current field being resolved. Uh, and remember, this is passed in to every resolver, right? So the name of uh, every uh, of the field being resolved, we have uh, an array representation of the remaining selection set. So the selection set, those are the fields in my query that I've said I want to be returned. Um, we have the GraphQL type of the field that's currently being resolved and also uh, of the parent. We have the path. So what are, uh, what are the fields that we've traversed so far to get to this point uh, for the field that we're resolving. We have a representation of the entire executable GraphQL schema. Uh, we have uh, a map of any, any of the query fragments that we're using. Uh, we have the root value, which is whatever we, we chose to pass into the GraphQL execution function. We have an AST of, uh, of the full query. And then we have any GraphQL variables that we've passed in. So all of these things are available to us inside our resolvers. So what are some ways that we can use those to, uh, to make efficient uh, GraphQL APIs? Well, 
there's three things um, in, in our integration anyway that, that we found very useful. I, th I think some of these concepts can be generalized as well. So the first is finding the nested selection set of a query. So at the root, looking ahead essentially, what are all of the fields uh, in a nested fashion that are requested uh, by this GraphQL query? Why is that useful? Well, if I can find that, then I can generate a single database query, whether it's Cypher, SQL, whatever, uh, from the root level to fetch all of the data from my database that I need to resolve this single uh, GraphQL query. And then we also use it to implement GraphQL schema directives, specifically one called Cypher and Relation. Um, and this, this might seem a little odd to you that we do it this way, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So first of all, let, let's take a look at, uh, at our query again. So we're looking for sessions. We're filtering by some search string, traversing out from those sessions a bit. So how can we find the nested selection set uh, using the resolve info object? So I'm not going to show you the code that we use to do this um, because it has uh, a, few, a few considerations that, that are not relevant here. But fortunately, um, Benji from Graphile uh, has us covered with the GraphQL parse resolve info uh, library. So basically what, what this does is it can take a resolve info uh, object and give us the parsed version, uh, which includes the nested selection set. So uh, I can pass this library my resolve info uh, in the resolver, and I get back all of the fields being requested and, and some metadata uh, about the fields as well. So if I have that, that means that I can then iterate over that and generate a single database query. Uh, again, whether it's Cypher, SQL, or, or whatever. Um, here's what that looks like uh, in Cypher. And this, this looks very similar to the database query that we wrote by hand when we were searching for uh, for sessions and, and traversing out and returning a graph. Um, I, I just mentioned this is not uh, what an actual generated query looks like. They look a bit different because they're, they're machine generated. This is sort of the, the handwritten version of that. But, but what I want to point out here is in the return, but previously we were just returning the graph object we matched on. Here we're doing sort of a, a map projection to return only the fields that we've requested in the GraphQL query. And we get back this uh, this map, essentially, which we can just uh, return uh, from our, our roots level resolver, and that handles the entire GraphQL query uh, in one, one database query, which is quite nice, quite efficient. We don't have to worry about this n plus one problem. So that's finding the selection set and generating a single database query. The next piece that we want to think about is custom logic. So kind of what we've talked about so far are, are these basic CRUD operations, right? So querying data in the database, creating data in the database. But what about more um, sort of data intensive, more custom things? And specifically, what about our recommended field? Remember we, in that example, we saw that, OK, once we're at a session, uh, can we find similar sessions that a user might be interested in? So there are two schema directives that we introduce in our Neo4j GraphQL JS library. One is the relation directive. So we use this to basically keep track of uh, metadata about the property graph model that doesn't really have a great place to fit in the type definitions. So the property graph model, uh, every relationship has a type and a direction. Uh, so we use this relation directive to sort of encode that information. What, what do you want to call this relationship and what direction should it go in? And then the other uh, directive that we add is a cipher directive. So what this allows us to do is essentially annotate our type definitions with a cipher query to define a computed field. So here we're defining the uh, recommended field which then maps to the Cypher query, which this is essentially just saying, traverse out from uh, this session, find sessions that have overlapping uh, tracks or themes, uh, and give me an aggregation account on those. Uh, those are probably going to be more relevant for, uh, for my user. So it allows us to define this sort of custom logic and computed fields 
But again, we still don't have to write resolvers. We just sort of annotate our, our type definitions. And that query runs as a subquery within our one generated database query. So we're still making just one uh, database query, one round trip, uh, but we just inject that as a subquery uh, from the GraphQL uh, schema. And here now is what that, that looks like. Now in our response, we have this recommended uh, field which has the title of the talks that if you're interested in this session, you might be interested in uh, in the next one as well. So that may seem like kind of a weird way to implement schema directives if you've done that before. Um, and it's probably not the way you want to implement schema directives unless it directly impacts the way that you're sort of generating your, your data fetching logic. Um, instead, there uh, are some features in GraphQL tools from Apollo that allow you to implement uh, schema directives. Um, we, we use this also for our authorization schema directives. Um, so you can also add you know, protected fields based on, on roles and, and scopes uh, as well. Cool, so that was kind of a, a dive into this resolve info object. Um, hopefully I convinced you that it's not super scary. Uh, it's something that you can actually make use of for uh, making efficient uh, GraphQL APIs. And specifically, reminder, these are the things we talked about, finding the nested selection set, generating a single database query from that, and implementing schema directives uh, as well. So I want to leave you with just a few resources for uh, learning more information uh, about this kind of stuff. Uh, first one, there is a blog post that Prisma wrote uh, a while ago, demystifying the info arguments in GraphQL resolvers uh, that walks through what's in there um, in, in a bit more detail than, than what I did today, has some examples. So that's, uh, that's a good resource. Uh, also, Eric Baer gave a great talk uh, a couple years ago at GraphQL Summit, at GraphQL Under the Hood, um, that talks about sort of how this, uh, this execution stuff works in GraphQL. That's, uh, that's a good resource. If you're interested in learning more about the Neo4j GraphQL integrations, we just had a online conference, and I think we had eight talks that were specifically about uh, our GraphQL integration, including uh, some from uh, our customers, like Under Armour, talking about how they use it to build things, um, others from more technical deep dives in, into how it works. So uh, check that out if that's interesting. Um, as Jake mentioned, I, I'm working on a book called Full Stack GraphQL, published by Manning. Um, I'm sure my publisher would be very upset if I failed to, to mention that today. Um, it, it's out now in, in an early release, uh, so I think like the first uh, third of the book uh, is out now. There's a discount code. CTW GQL 19, um, and that's good. Not, that's good actually for any Manning products, not just for this book. So um, feel free to, to check that out. There's some other resources uh, pointing in here um, as well that I'll, I'll just leave sort of for your interest um, as you get the slides. But the last thing I want to mention is at lunch today, I'm hosting a, a topic table using GraphQL with a graph database. So that's at uh, 12:30. Um, if you're interested in chatting more, come to that uh, or come to our booth. We have a, a booth downstairs. Just look for uh, a spooky skeleton and uh, some spider webs and, and you'll find us. Uh, and some of my colleagues are, are over there as, as well that can give you some more information and, and chat with you about this stuff. So the slides are, are available, uh, bit.ly slash resolve info. And I'll post them on Twitter too if you want to, to look for that. Um, other than that, that's uh, all I have.